first glimpse into this um, and this church in Antioch, which is going to be the first church planting church. And what we saw about that church in Antioch was that the church in Antioch, they were willing to take risks, right, to speak about Jesus in this city, third largest city in the Roman world, massive, cosmopolitan, pagan city. And they were willing to take some risks to take the gospel outside of the synagogue, outside of the Jewish culture. And they wanted to bring it to the pagans, bring it to the Gentiles. And so they got real creative, real entrepreneurial, and they, they took the gospel out with them. We saw that they were quick to identify evidences of God's grace. We saw that they were serious about discipleship. They spent a year together going really deep into scriptures to really begin to grow and establish leaders. And then uh, finally, we saw their church that gave generously. They were willing to support the work and send money back to Jerusalem. So this week, we're going to see three more attributes of a church planning church and what this looks like. And so taken together, I hope this will begin to kind of give us a little bit of a vision of what it would look like for us to be a uh, church planning church. So, so I've got four more things I want to add to that list we did from two weeks ago. So I want to suggest to you then, if you're taking notes, four things that made, four more things that made Antioch a church planning church. And so here they are. Right, the church in Antioch had gifted church planters, gifted guys. Um, second, the church in Antioch had godly church planters. We're going to see that in this text. Um, third, the church in Antioch had called church planters, right? These were not just guys that just thought, hey, this would be cool. Like, these are guys that are called um, to plant a church. And finally, uh, the church in Antioch commissioned these church planters. So there was a role that the church played in this church planting process. So let's jump right in. Let's take a look again, our second look here at this church in Antioch that we see uh, right here in verse 13. Right now that we're in the church in Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who's called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, many a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So, so here are the people that Luke wants to highlight for us. So the first thing Luke is going to tell us about this church in Antioch is that they have some gifted prophets and teachers, okay? That's, that's significant for church planting. You need to have prophets and teachers. And Luke is going to list five guys who are essentially on the preaching team at Antioch, right? So, so they had a pretty stacked team of guys, right? At Redemption City, we've got one guy on the preaching team right now. When we bring in guys from over at Crossroads or wherever else to kind of fill in the pulpit. And so what we're going to need to do, if we're going to be church playing church, right, we need to get some more guys on the preaching team here at Redemption City Church. You can actually see that over the course of the summer. Some new guys that we're raising up from within our church to kind of jump in to the preaching team. But, but the guys that we've got here are five guys, and it's a unique lineup uh, of men that are here leading this church. It's a, it's a diverse team I want you to see for a very diverse and cosmopolitan city. And so, so Barnabas, we've already been introduced to back a couple weeks ago. He's a native of Cyprus, right? A little island off the coast there of Palestine. You know, Greek culture. That's where he's coming from. We got this guy uh, also named Simeon, who, who from his nickname, right, Niger, we suspect he's probably a black African, and so he's coming from probably somewhere in northeast Africa, so bringing a little bit of cultural diversity to this team. We know that Lucius here is from Africa because it says he's Lucius of Cyprus, and so that was a leading intellectual center in the, uh, in the world of that time. Some of the best philosophers, believe it or not, were coming out of Cyrene in Northeast Africa. And then we also have a man uh, by the name of Manahim who was from Palestine, grew up in the court of Herod the Tetrarch, so he would have been probably more of a Jewish Palestinian background, grew up in that, in those cultures, very elite, very educated um, Roman household there. And so um, we've got him, and then we've got Saul, who of course um, jumped onto the scene there, a persecutor of the church, he's a Pharisee. And, Pharisees, but converted to Christianity. He is from Tarsus, which is a city just to the north of Antioch. It also would have been a very uh, Greek city, um, sort of a Hellenistic culture. So we've got this diverse 
teaching team, but what all of these guys have in common, and what Luke wants us to see, is that they're all prophets and teachers. You know, these two gift sets seem to be the thing that really characterized these men that are ultimately going to go on to plant churches all over the world. And so we've, we've seen already in the book of Acts, as we've been kind of going through um, this series, right back in Acts 6, 4, that the apostles, right, they're going to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So teaching is going to be very important for the apostles from the beginning, making sure people know right, who God is, what he's all about. That has been central to the mission of the church. And so in chapter 13, we see this is true of these men as well, these leaders in the church. They're going to be Bible guys, right? They know the scriptures, right? They're going to be guys that are going to be devoted to prayer, as we're going to see a little bit later on. And so, so both of these gifts here, the gifts of prophecy and teaching, they're actually spiritual gifts found in the list of spiritual gifts. If you look at Romans 12, 6 through 7, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Ephesians 4, 11, we'll see these two gift clusters, they, they kind of come together. They are complementary gifts that work together to relevantly communicate God's will. And so, so let me give you some quick definitions of what these things are, because prophecy, we're like, whoa, there's prophecy going on around here? This is kind of crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what these men were gifted with. And so prophecy is the communication of spontaneous revelation from God um, that we learn from the rest of the New Testament needs to be weighed by the church. And so, so if someone is given insight from God, given an application, given an exhortation, given an encouragement, given a word that directly applies to your life, you know, like, man, I, I don't know how he knew that. You know, when, when you walk away from a sermon going, I think he was preaching to me. I think, like, you know, he, he heard something about my life and, like, somehow he's, like, speaking directly to me. That's not because, like, we go around and try to do research on everyone out in the congregation and go, oh, what would be really relevant to that person? No, that's prophecy. That's when God is speaking through the pastor to you. He doesn't even know it because he's, he's speaking God's truth in a timely, relevant fashion and applying it to your situation, your life, ways that are somewhat supernatural. I mean, Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, you know, would have moments where he'd say, there is somebody in the crowd right now who is going through X, Y, or Z, and, and, and guys would just be like falling out of their chairs because they're like, no one knows that except God. That, that's prophecy. That's when that happens. We believe that happens. Well, we believe you got to be pretty careful with that. Like if somebody gets up there and says, hey, God told me you should move to Africa. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa may, maybe, maybe not. First Corinthians 14, 29 says, let two or three prophets speak and let others weigh what is said. Okay, so be careful. You know, if you're going to come up and say you're a prophet or something here in the church, like, whoa, you know, we're, we're going to weigh what you say because we don't think you're speaking with the authority and inspiration of Scripture. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21 also says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. And so, so we believe God does speak to us relevantly. He's alive, right? It's not just the, uh, the words that are out there. We believe God speaks to us through people that God has brought into the church. The second gift here is teaching. Teaching is the communication, right, of special revelation from God. Right, that is authoritatively revealed in Scripture. And so there's a very qualitative difference between a, a prophecy and teaching that is out of the Word of God, that is inspired by God, that is authoritative for life and practice. Right, as we're weighing prophecies, right, we're going to be weighing them according to what God has definitively revealed. And so if, if you're going to come off with some crazy prophecy right, that, that's contradicting this book, it's clearly off limits, and that's something uh, we're just going to throw to the side. So these two gifts were, were crucial. Paul told um, Titus in, in Titus 2, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Teach what's in this book, in the scriptures. And that's, those are the kind of things right, that are needed for uh, health and vitality of the church. We're going to read further on in the pastoral epistles that teaching is a requirement for elders, and of course for church planners as well, who will be elders 
in a church. In 1 Timothy 3, 2, it says that the elder must be able to teach or apt to teach. Someone who is gifted in teaching. It doesn't mean he has to be able to get up here and preach, but that means he's going to be able to teach people, maybe small groups, maybe individual discipling, mentoring. But elders are people that teach, they're people that pastor the church well. And so that's going to be an essential qualification. Also, Titus 1.9 says that the uh, elder, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy word as it is taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. And so while this gift of teaching and of prophecy is, is given to others, right, it's a requirement for elders. So, so any of you out there could have the gift of teaching or the gift of prophecy, men, women, doesn't matter. You know, God distributes those gifts out there, but for an elder, this is a requirement, something that is absolutely necessary, mandatory for the flourishing of the church. And so, so why is, is prophecy and teaching so important for church planning? Why is this going to be such a vital quality if this church is going to be sending out this caliber of men? What I want to suggest to you is that, that because prophets and teachers, it's, it's so essential, because prophets and teachers communicate who God is, what he has done, and how we're called to live. Right? If, if we aren't hearing from God, right, then we don't have a church anymore. We just have a social club. We just have people that are just kind of hanging out together. But there's got to be somebody teaching us who God is, what he's done, and how we're called to live in light of that. That's the essential role of teachers that are speaking God's word, because we're not just here to hear Mike's opinions or Mike's hobby horses or, or any of that kind of thing. We want to hear from God, and that's why we open the Bible and preach through it systematically every week, and that is vital. Without prophets and teachers, we're not going to know God. We're not going to enter into a relationship with him. We're not going to be the church that God has called us to be. Romans 10, 14 through 15, Paul says it like this. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Right? Good prophets and teachers, they, they love to communicate the gospel. They love to lay it out there that Jesus plus nothing equals everything, that, that Jesus did it all so that we get it all, that salvation is all of grace, right? And we, we receive it as a gift of God. But there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just, just to give you a few statements from some favorite pastors, right, of mine. The teachers love to communicate the gospel so that people can enter into the fullness of a relationship with God and so that they can have that richness and fullness in their lives. And so, so without good teachers, without good preachers, without prophets, right, people aren't going to get into the relationship with Jesus. They're not going to enter into the fullness of all that God is for us. And and, and they're going to be missing out. You know, we may have a great hangout. We may be doing some great social justice stuff. But, but at the center of a church plant is Jesus and getting to know him. And that's what teachers labor in. But good teachers aren't merely eloquent. They, they reproduce themselves. Paul says in uh, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Did you get that, right? So, so teachers, not only are they going to get up there and they're going to preach the gospel, all that God is for us through Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, just, just lavish that on their people so they love it and so they use it in all of their lives, right? Right, a real man of God, a teacher, is he's going to reproduce himself because he's going to recognize the own limitations of his life. And that's what we're doing here at Redemption City, raising up elders here, raising up some teachers in this church congregation. Because, because a good teacher and leader has got to reproduce himself. He's got to entrust his word to faithful men. And so that's something we are very much desiring to do, particularly as a church planning church, right? If we're going to send out teachers, we have got to, we've got to raise them up here, and we've got to trust this gospel to faithful men who we can send on out um, with it. And so, so good teachers 
not only preach sound doctrine, not only preach the gospel, but they also protect the church from, from false teaching that can destroy a new church. You know, from a lot of the divisive teachings that are out there, you know, counterfeit nonsense that's out there, prosperity gospel, all the things that destroy a church and destroy your personal spiritual life because it's just not true. So we need a lot of gifted prophets and teachers really to be raised up. And that's why it's exciting to see guys right that are in seminary here and some guys that have pastoral experience. You know, we have guys that are hungry to be in God's Word. So I love our life group system. Man, we got dudes that are just getting discipled, women that are getting discipled, women that just want to grow in their faith and, and go deeper into the Word. It's, it's an awesome privilege to pastor a church where we have so many men and women Right? Who want to jump into God's word and, and really just excited to, to lead the charge alongside of us. And so, so, so yeah, so that's point number one. Man, I have three more to go. I'm like already like burning the clock up here. But, but this is good. Obviously, I like teaching myself. So I, I got to really go off on this teaching point here because it's vital, right? We're not a teacher, right? We're not, we're not getting the gospel out anyone. So not only does the church of Antioch have gifted church planners, right, who can teach, who have a prophetic gift of speaking into people's lives, the church of Antioch had godly church planners. And this is, this is just as important, okay? You can never put gifting before godliness. And so Luke wants us to see that these church planners are godly men. And so I love how he does that here in verse 2. He wants us to see while they were Worshiping the Lord and fasting. And, and, and you may say, oh, that's just the two throwaway words there. But what Luke wants us to do is give us some of the credentials of these men. Right? These are men that don't merely learn about Jesus, right? Right? They're not like, you know, guys that can just cram in their heads full of theology, right? These are men that worship Jesus. These are men that fast for, for God's direction and God's calling in their lives. And these are these are people that, that really believe this stuff. Right? And it's easy, right, to, to go and make, you know, seminary your hobby or be you know, kind of an armchair theologian and just be like, yeah, it's kind of a hobby, like, you know, tracking fancy football and, you know, like to track my favorite dead theologians. You know, some of you guys are totally like, who does that? But but there are people out there that, that are like that. You kind of just have to go to seminary and find them. There's, there's lots of them. But what I want you to see here in this text is that knowledge is, is not enough to be an effective church planner. Being a gifted teacher is not enough. Being a prophet is not enough. These men knew and worshipped Jesus, right? They have a vital, ongoing relationship with him. And let me just give you maybe an illustration that would help. You know, we're, we're kind of coffee snobs around here, right? Right? We, we love to trace the, uh, the, the production of coffee, right, from its origins. You know, where was it raised? You know, what elevation? You know, what other kind of fruit, you know, trees were kind of weaved in with the cross-pollination? And, you know, you know were, were the workers given fair wages? Were, you know, was everything done with it? Was it transported quickly enough so it could be fresh enough? You know, where, where was it roasted? Where, you know, when was, when was the date on it? You know, was it, was it roasted at this date? Because it's like more than a week old. And they're like, ah, I don't know, man. Is that going to be all right? Can I drink it? You know, and, and the grind and then the it, Chemex or pour over or, you know, what approach to distilling this coffee. But, but you could know all of those things, but if you never drink the coffee, and I'm like, wow, that is amazing. Like, if you could be a coffee expert and not actually be one that enjoys coffee, and that's, that's the danger of the armchair theologian kind of guy. You could be somebody who likes this whole process, but you, you don't like the coffee. I mean, you don't like Jesus. You don't, you're in a relationship with him that really is the source of joy in your heart. It's the source of freedom in your heart. It's the source of the peace that's kind of established in your soul, right? You're not daily drinking of Oh, 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 Tully likes to go at 200 proof grace of the gospel and, and just being intoxicated with, with what God has done for us in Jesus. And so if we have church planners that are knowledgeable and they know the city, they know the demographics, they know the history, they know the problems, they know the all that kind of stuff about their town and you know, but, but they're not in the mix, right? They don't love Jesus and they don't love the people where they're going to plant, right? I mean, it's just not going to mean anything, is it? 
We need men, right, that are not only gifted, but men that are godly, that love the Lord with our heart and soul and mind and strength and, and love their neighbors here in the city just like they love themselves. That, that's what's necessary. That is what is so vital for church planners. I mean, what could be worse than a church planner who hasn't experienced the transforming presence and power of Jesus, right? I mean, how could that man help anybody else? Right? If they haven't experienced God's grace deeply at work in their lives, how are they going to walk anybody else through that? I mean, if you like somebody who really likes planes a lot, it's like, I've studied planes, you know, I'm gonna, you, you want me to fly you over to England? Yeah, I, I, that'd be dangerous, wouldn't it? Like, you, you go to flight school, you not only learn about flying, but you actually log in the hours flying so that you actually can safely deliver people from point A to point B. There are so many guys that you're playing that are just kind of armchair theologians. They, they, got, they like the culture, they like the mix, they like hanging out at coffee shops and bars and meeting people and studying theology, but there, there isn't that godliness, there isn't that maturity in their lives that is so requisite, that is so required. Not only are they, they worshipers, right? Not only, not only they, they know about God, they, they celebrate and they worship and they enjoy Him. You don't have to twist their arm to tell them to pray and, and to get into his word. I mean, these guys are also fasting. And so you say, well, fasting, that, that's it's kind of, a, you know, why do people do that anymore? What's the deal with fasting? Fasting, if you look through scripture, is typically associated with discerning God's will. You don't fast for fasting's sake. It's not like God gives you brownie points for, well, you didn't eat food today. My hands are tied. Now I've got to give you whatever you want. You know, that's, that's not how it works. Fasting is designed for you to focus more deeply on God. And who he is. Fasting is about developing a hunger for God, right? Because we, we don't have any trouble. If we miss a meal, man, we're like, I'm hungry. Like, gosh, I gotta get a sandwich or something. You know, we're, we're so easily moved in that, in that direction there. And, and that's the same thing with our relationship with God, right? We, we need to hunger for him like we hunger for a meal. Like we just got to enjoy some of my, like a painter's famous barbecue yesterday, and I mean, let me tell you, talk about a beautiful picture of, like, developing a hunger for God, like, man, I, I love that, I mean, love me some of that pork, right, I mean, it's very tangible, very concrete, very easy, that's the kind of relationship we're supposed to have with God, we're supposed to have that tangible hungering after Him, desiring for Him, longing for Him, and longing to hear his will and follow him. And, and that's about fasting. It's about committing ourselves, not just to our own will and agenda, but to his will and agenda. To learn what he wants for us. Prayer and fasting always go together because in fasting we're seeking to discern not what we want, but what God wants. Because that's what ultimately important. And so these men, gifted teachers, godly men, they're going to go, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? Where do you want us to plant a church? And and as they're, they're waiting, God is going to step in. And uh, I love what Daryl Box says. I, I thought it would be worth quoting for you here, and I think I have it up on the screen as well. Um, he says this about the church act. I thought this was good. He said, God loves churches that look beyond their own needs. One wonders where the church today would be if Antioch had not been led to look beyond its own community and city limits to do evangelism. Everything about Acts shows us that it's Impetus is towards the church's call and mission. We build churches not just to go in for worship, but also to go out with God's heart for people. And that's what, that's what a godly man has. God's heart for God, who is the ultimately supremely valuable thing in the universe, but God's heart then for the people around us in our city. So that's, that's the heart of the church planner. So not only is the church in have gifted men and godly men who are planning churches, the church of Antioch also has called church planners. This is important, again, because you know, a, lot of, a lot of young guys are like, hey man, I'm ready church, let's go. In fact, I was one of those, actually. Uh, true confession, I was 21, I was like, I'm going, man, I'm ready to plant church, this is so awesome. I mean, I mean, I don't have to have a boss. I can just kind of do my own, like, sort of thing. And, you know, I just got to seminary at 21, so I know everything that all these other pastors in the world don't know. And so I'm going to fix it. I'm going to build the perfect church. It's going to be incredible. No, train wreck in the, in the making, man, right? Not good, right? You need a calling 
from God. And that's exactly what these men received here in verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. This is, this is absolutely vital. Paul and Barnabas didn't volunteer to go church playing. We're kind of getting bored in Antioch. You know, really don't like, you know, that sermon series you're preaching or the color of your carpet or, you know, so we want to go do our own thing. That, that's not what we have happening here. This isn't a volunteer mission. This isn't like we're bored. We want some adventure, some excitement in our lives. This is a calling from God. Church planning is, is God's idea, right? It's not just a new and trendy strategy for entrepreneurs and creative types, right? It's something that God has designed, God has designed to spread his gospel to the nations. And so we're not really sure quite how um, this was communicated here. It says the Holy Spirit said, said we don't know if this is an audible voice. Did, did they all hear the Holy Spirit say verbally that? Or uh, probably more likely one of the prophets in the church said, you know, said, hey, I just got a prophecy from God that you guys are supposed to go and plant a church over there. That, that's likely um, could have been more of a general impression that all the church felt like I mean, we are in a uniquely positioned place to spread this gospel. We're really not sure. Luke doesn't give us the, the details, the dynamics of how it happened. But we do know from the conclusion that the whole church agreed together, this is what God is calling us to do. And we're going to see that they, they send them out to do it. So a call from God is, is just crucial to church planning. Church planning is really hard. Um, if you don't know that, there are spiritual, emotional, relational, and financial burdens that are unique to church planning, right? That are, that are totally different than any other kind of venture which you're going on. You may not think about a lot of those dynamics, but it's not simply like a business where you're just kind of starting something up and, you know, doing the marketing, making sure you get the budget and the numbers. You, you can plan a church like that. Churches get planned like that all the time. But a real church, right, it's, it, there's spiritual battle going on because a real church is trying to kick down the gates of hell, right, and bring people out. It's trying to reach lost people. There's spiritual battle. You're putting yourself into spiritual opposition. There are burdens, right, on your family. Um, if they're kind of wrestling with the call that you've got on their life, there are, there are a lot of things going on in the life of church, like fundraising. And so it's hard, right? And, and you're going to either give up or you're going to kind of blow up in a bad way. Right? If you're not called to ministry, right, the pressures upon you are going to be magnified and you're, the wheels are just going to kind of come off on your, on your life, right, if you don't have a call from God and aren't digging deeply into the resources of His grace and His mercy daily as uh, a church planner. I love what Charles Spurgeon said uh, to his students, and I think I've got it up here on the screen, and this is, this is just classic Spurgeon. He says, do not enter into the ministry if you can help it. If any student in this room could be content to be a newspaper editor, a grocer, a farmer, a doctor, a lawyer, a senator, even a king, in the name of heaven and earth, let him go his way. As Spurgeon is saying, if you can do anything else, don't go into pastoral ministry, don't go into church planning, right? It, this, is, this has got to be a calling. God is unique, it's different than any other vocation or any other occupation in which you are going to involve yourself. So, so, so don't go into church planning if you can do anything else. If you can you be content to do any other kind of ministry, don't, don't go this direction. There are a lot of other ways to uh, uh, get some exciting, fulfilling life goals and callings. And, and of course, uh, for myself, I uh, experienced a lot of that. Many of you know I was heading in the opposite direction, trying to be a lawyer and go as far away from ministry and pastoring as I possibly could. And, and God just kept shutting doors in my face and, and you know, constantly turning me around and, and you know, just, just uh, kind of grabbing a hold of my heart until I couldn't do anything else at all. So that, that's just what God will do to you. If, if you're one of those guys where God's put that calling on your heart, right, you're not going to be able to do anything else. You're going to, you know, you're going to be like, Paul, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. If I can't get out there with the gospel. And that means even if you're not employed in it, this is crucial, okay? Even if you're not at the job, you're going to still do it. Even if you're like 
even if you're like shoveling trash, I mean, you're working like as a janitor, it doesn't matter. You're going to have this heart and this calling. You don't have to have a job for to have this calling, right? But it's wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, you're going to have this burden. And whatever else you're doing to provide for yourself, man, this is going to be the call burning in your heart. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. So you're going to be preaching the gospel, and the church is going to identify that. Like, That's the kind of guy we want on staff. That's the guy we want to send out as a church planner. That's the kind of guy we're looking for who's got the call uh, to preach. And so not only does the church have the call, gifted and godly church players finally here and, uh, and shortly here, the church at Antioch has commissioned church players. And this is, this is crucial here. Paul and Barnabas, they don't tell the church, hey, God told us to plant church. We're going. Peace. See you later. We read here in verse 3, is that they, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and set them off. Okay, so, so there's a process here, right, that the church undergoes. Rather than, you know, they're going to just, you know, go, hey, we're out of here, right? The church is going to fast and they're going to pray before commissioning these men. And we're not told what they prayed and fasted for, but it'd certainly be reasonable to expect, right? They're praying for discernment. Is this the word of God? Is this for real? Is this prophecy or word of is this is this God's leading let's let's pray let's fast let's let's make sure as a church together we're on the same page we're united around this vision and this calling and so there's a discernment process going on by the church to see if this is the direction that they should go and we know the result of course right after praying and fasting we're like yes these are gifted, godly, called men. We want to send them out to plant a church. And so they commissioned them. What we do with Alexiana today, they hand said, hey, God, we think you're calling this person in this direction. God, would you bless their, would you bless their church planting journeys? And, and of course, uh, the rest of the book of Acts are, are just stories of the incredible exploits of Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas as they're taking this gospel and seeing incredible fruit an incredible growth um, through the gospel. But they're not, they're not going to short circuit the process, right? right? They're a part of a local church, and that local church is going to send them out and plant them. And so what I would suggest to you is that most church planter types don't like authority. It's self-starters, independent, self-motivated, and then, you know, throw on top of that, people like me, they're kind of a like millennial generation that are already kind of anti-establishment, anti-authority to begin with, you know, it could be a challenge, right? Because those are the kind of guys you want to plant a church, right? People that have drive, passion, commitment, they're going to work hard at it. But, but they've also got to be willing to learn um, to be people under authority because, right, as a pastor, you know, if you don't understand that you're under the authority of God and under the authority of godly men in the church, right, you're going to blow this thing up. You're going to be a train wreck if this thing becomes about your ego and about your agenda and your success. And so we see here again uh, this beautiful picture of two men who understand what it means to be under authority and to go out with the full blessing of the church. And, and it's, it's really a beautiful thing. And so, so I'm, I'm going long already. I get really excited because I love church planning and get fired up about this and, and really just have seen for myself man, the difference church plants can make in a city, in the lives of people, in the lives of families, in the lives of the lost. I mean, and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. You say maybe at the end here, what if I'm not called to plant a church? You know? Is this, this message just kind of shot right over my head? Maybe some of you guys are like, yes, man, I want to plant a church. But for many of you, it's like, whoa, okay, I'm not a church planner. It's pretty easy. What if I'm not called to plant a church? What can I do? So let me give you five things, okay, as a church planning church that all of you can do to be a part of as uh, the church planning church that we are. First one is help us recruit and identify church planners, okay? So, so you've now gotten my seven points of what a church planner looks like in this sermon and the last sermon on Antioch. You can begin to look around and identify who are the guys that have that. Maybe it's your life group leader. Maybe it's your redemption community leader. Maybe you know somebody in town who's maybe part of a different church, maybe even part of a different denomination. You say, this guy is a church planner. We would love to get them connected. We're going to start a church planning network lunch in the fall. We're just going to be doing free lunch, training, prayer for anybody who's coming in. It doesn't have to be from our denomination, tradition, background. We just want to bless church planners, pray for them, train them, encourage them. And so if you know people like that, 
who have a heart for church planning, passion for church planning. It's just a guy here a couple weeks ago who came down, visited from another church, praying about church planning. He's from a totally different kind of denominational background. But I was like, man, we would love to have you in there. We'd love to get you together with other men that are passionate about church planning so you can kind of sharpen each other like iron sharpens iron. So there's encouragement. So, so keep your eyes out for church planners. Second thing you can do is encourage church planners. Remember I said there are there's, there's intense spiritual, emotional, relational, financial challenges to planning. So I would encourage you to adopt a church plan. Right? You find somebody that we've got a couple guys we're supporting now, like Joe Swords, Mike Hannafy over in Detroit. And we've got some cool guys. I encourage you to think about adopting a church plan. Right? And, you know, you know, say it's a... Uh, you know, Christmas, send them a little Christmas encouragement card. Maybe send them a gift card or something on their birthday. Maybe their anniversary. You know, church planners are on a tight budget. You know, send them a little gift card to go out to their favorite restaurant. That kind of thing. I, I don't care to me how many times I've been blessed by that, by people that have just been like, hey, I just want to encourage you, send you out. So, so as we're thinking about the challenges of church planning, you could be uh, an encourager by prayer and by any, any number of things. Third thing you can do is you can serve. We are going to be hosting this network lunch, and so if you like to get food together, like if you like to make a little hospitable environment, uh, if you like to just be an encourager and a servant and volunteer for that, that would be great because um, it would be kind of hard for me to run around leading and teaching and doing all this stuff. We need some people to help volunteer just on a monthly network meeting. Just be willing to help buy some burritos down at Chipotle, buy some great, you know, Walk and you know make a great you know, spread for these church planners just to encourage them and bless them and so um, so you can serve you can pray again um, find a church planner just pray for them get on their mailing list I know a couple of guys we encourage you to do, encourage you to do that as well and then finally you can give you can give to Redemption City Church to our work of church planning that we're doing here or you can give directly to church planners again we got a list of guys that we're supporting that you can directly give and help those guys out with because what they're doing is extremely difficult, but they are plowing in new ground to see the gospel run all over the state of Michigan and all over the world. And so as a church, our vision from the beginning, you know, has been that we're seeking to be a redemption movement that impacts the world through church planning. That's where we're going, it's what we want to be a part of. And so as we see our vision kind of aligned with scripture, which it should do on a lot of occasions, just want to really, really really encourage you guys to be a part of it whatever way you can. So let me pray. Father, I do thank you for an opportunity here on this Memorial Day uh, to get the opportunity to just celebrate what you've been doing in the lives of this church, God, the ways you've seen um, people raised up, empowered, uh, the ways we've been able to serve the community, the ways we've been able to already begin to support other church planters around the uh, the state, and I uh, just thank you, God, for just the privilege of, of being a church, God, raising up um, godly men to go out and impact the world um, for your gospel and your kingdom. And so I pray that you raise up godly church planters. We do pray, God, uh, along with Noel over at that we can plant 100 churches in the next 20 years. Um, Father, to see the gospel just reseeded here in the state of Michigan. So, uh, would you just uh, work out in our midst? Would you call men, raise up men? Would you give us uh, leaders uh, to train and disciple? And God, we just ask just for your hand to be moving in the life of our church as it was in this early church in Acts. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.